So I just always loved catching air. air. It's just the best. Yeah. And I think that <laughs> anyone that skis, snowboards, the two things you want to do, go fast, catch air. Mm -hmm. That's like kind of what you want to do. It is right? so fun. Right? <laughs> That's like <laughs> when it works. When it works, yeah, it's super exactly. Fun. <laughs> What's going on, everyone? My name is Nils Mindnick, and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed towards providing insight on the outdoor industry by catching up with people who work within it. Today, we're going to be talking with Julian Carr, skier, entrepreneur, and founder of a really sick running race, the Cirque Series. Welcome. What's Thanks, going, man. What's going on? How you doing? Hanging out in Park City. Thanks yeah. for having me here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's May. It's springtime. Things are melting out. How was your winter? So much fun. Uh, I skied a lot of pow. Yeah. So, <laughs> no complaints, man. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of gauge my successful kind of productive winters based on like how much soft snow I find. Okay. So, but yeah, I skied a lot of pow this year, so it was a really great winter. That's cool. Where um, Are you based locally? Uh, so I still have like my office here for Cirque Series, but mm -hmm. um, I actually moved to Colorado for like my new home base. Oh, cool. Uh, like two and a half years ago. Nice. Yeah. What like uh, drove that? Because you were a Utah guy for a while. Right? Oh yeah, born and raised out here. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of a random kind of girl thing happened that got me out to Colorado. She's my wife now and we kind of got on the fast Congrats. track. Thanks because of uh, COVID. Yeah. And it, it was more of like... Um, let's go out to Colorado and, you know, I was going to travel a lot and, and then all of a sudden it's COVID. It kind of just fast tracked everything, but it was awesome. We built a cabin up at 13, uh, or up at 11,000 feet. That's where we live now. Yeah. And that's uh, freaking sweet. That's cool. Yeah. A lot yeah. of mountains. I'd say that Utah proximity wise and like user friendliness of like the Wasatch is just, you know, it's a freaking gem, but yeah. The quantity um, of the mountains in Colorado is yeah. amazing, but the they're so spread out, um, and obviously traffic's rowdy. Uh, so it's it's been fun though to, to kind of learn like which freeways connect which mountain range, and to really learn how truly how big everything is out there. Uh, and then you just got to drive further and deal with traffic sometimes. But I've been figuring it out. Okay, yeah. Is this the first time you've moved outside of Utah? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I mean I've. Been do, I've done so much traveling and I've always just been like, man, I'm just proud Salt Lake guy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's definitely interesting living somewhere else. I'm loving it. Interesting. Yeah, I know. I'm kind of, I'm in like a similar, similar boat. I, like I grew up on the East coast in Vermont, moved to Park City to go to high school. And then since then I've just been in Salt Lake and I kind of like, especially right when you're in like the thick of it with a ski or snowboarding career, finding uh, a place like Salt Lake that the infrastructure is just sort of in place for you to travel easily or like ski and snowboard a bunch it makes like such a big difference on your day to day. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. And you can have uh, like, I guess more diverse uh, friend circles. You know, you don't have to have your only crew is like kind of weird mountain people, snow crowd. Like you can actually go hang out with people that maybe aren't in the snow scene at all. And that's pretty unique. I... I was talking extensively to a friend about this like a year ago or something and, and we were kind of unpackaging or discussing, you know, how much we liked that and how you can kind of like switch up your friend group because in a lot of these mountain towns are like, are pretty remote, right? So a ski town isn't necessarily always like a bustling city with like a diverse selection of people, but I sort of, I don't know. I think that's why I was drawn to Salt Lake partially was because my side passion being climbing and then while i was also in college there's kind of these like different communities that you get plugged into and then for me it kind of helped uh at least slightly broaden my perspective instead of existing in a complete vacuum <laughs> totally yeah i agree and i think that's healthy you know to have yeah. a lot of other perspectives around yeah but i mean you just can't beat the proximity of adventure I know. Uh, if you're living in like, you know, a major metropolitan metropolitan city and you can drive five minutes to a trail, like, five, like 10 minutes to like really good climbing, 35 minutes to, you know, some of the best skiing in the world. It's just crazy how it's all right here. You know? Yeah. How was that growing up here? You were, so you're in Salt Lake. Yeah. Family is here, went to school here. Yeah. Um, were they also like skiers and mountain folk or did you kind of like find that on your own? You know, my always been camping and hiking my dad like really long hikes uh so i came from like a camping kind of outdoorsy family 
Um, my dad didn't ski, my sister doesn't ski, my mom skied, and she'd just go over once in a while with her, with her friends. And I grew up playing team sports, lots of gymnastics, skateboarding, and in fifth grade, I tried snowboarding. First day, first run, twisted my knee up pretty good and got taken down on the toboggan. And fast forward to eighth grade, my mom talked to me into going skiing with her. And I was kind of like, okay, mom, I'll, I'll go skiing with you. Yeah, and okay, just, mom. Yeah, first day, just immediately fell in love with it. And I'm like, I'm doing this forever. Well, so, what, do you kind of remember what the feeling was like? Because for me, I I started so early, I don't remember like really even learning, but like, what, did you have kind of this aha moment? Oh, like, totally. I mean, I remember just watching people from the chairlift and being like, I think I that looks really easy. Yeah. It just made sense. And then as soon as I started going, it just made sense to me. I never snow plowed. Yeah. I just was mobbing like, Sick. Just right away. Like, where'd you guys, okay. where'd you guys go skiing? Uh, that first day, first few times were, was Brighton. Yep. Yeah. Just on the old, uh, what's the one next to Crest? Millie, maybe to the right? No. Other side. Um, Majestic. Uh, there's Great Western on the, the other one between. Right? Majestic, isn't it? I think it's Majestic. Yeah. yeah so Majestic is yeah. what I learned on quite a bit. No and way. First three years of season pass in high school was uh, Solitude. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. And how did like... At the time, was there a pretty strong ski community and scene? And, and um, like, did you know what, like, professional skiing was or anything no, at that not point? At like, how did that sort of get on your radar? It was kind of fun at Solitude because me and my buddies were just thrashing around trying to find jumps and cliffs and stuff. And there's just no other posses around like that. And we were kind of confused by it. Um, and then when I was a senior, I started skiing at Snowbird a bit more and definitely saw some more of like the skier crews. Um, and I'm like, okay, there's more people that's doing what we do. Um, uh, but I mean, the first movie I went and saw was, uh, like the Scott Schmidt story. Whoa. Um, and I was like, yeah, oh yeah, this dude's got it figured out. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I did a lot of gymnastics when I was a kid, so I love the foam pit. So, you know, first time I felt powder, I was like, oh, sweet. Like this is just a big foam pit, you know, like all the whole, the whole arena, all this is just foam. If you can find the right deep snow. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, once I got into college, I'm like, obviously picking up like every powder magazine, freeze magazine, You're um, free skier just comes out. Uh, all the MSP movies are starting up, um, teach, you know, TGR, all that stuff. And I'm, you know, watching everything and I'm just like, how do these dudes, how are they, how are they figuring like out to be plugged into all this? You yeah. Know? And so yeah. I just got pretty intrigued on, you know, how, what does that landscape look like? You know, like how, what is professional skiing? What does that yeah. mean? How can I make that happen? Yeah. What did, I mean, like, how did you make that transition? Because I, I am curious, like everyone's story is a little bit different how they ended up in it. Right. And like, I think it's really cool that like you were sort of out of phase as a little bit more of a young adult, right? Making that transition because these days you have, you know, kids know the protocol, right? You go to the, the mountain team, you do the contest, you get scouted mm -hmm. sometimes by sponsors where you like get your following on Instagram and you kind of just like make these incremental steps. But like, what was the landscape for you to kind of get that first foot in the door moment? I'd say that, you know, it was realizing that a lot of the guys uh that were in the movies the magazines were you know alta snowbird utah based um so i just found them and we like picked their brain yeah and i was like hey can i like you know take you to lunch or i don't remember what i did but i remember i just got in touch with them yeah um and made a point to you know not barge into their life but at the same time like i had a lot of intent to have some dialogue and, and get to know these people. Um, and it was great because from doing that, I, you know, became friends with everybody, like, cause they're all what I found. And, you know, the snow scene is anyone that makes a career out of it are usually very, uh, very cool people because mm -hmm. um, they have the patience and the skills and the love to make it happen. Cause there's lots of other career paths you can go down that you have to work as hard. Um, yeah to make it happen and and you don't have to work in such interesting environment you know yeah um so yeah after talking to photographers other athletes i just realized that the professional side of it is just that like you have to work hard you have to understand the digital side of things um, and back then you know this is like the early 2000s and 
it was, you know, evolving a lot. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was the traditional media that was very, very important, which is the movies, magazines and, and mm-hmm. print. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and it was like you're either in that, you know, scene or you're trying to. Um, so that was fun to understand it. And I was like, okay, hey, movies and magazines are like, you know, um, the end result. But where's your distribution? So yeah. you have to get to know the cinematographers, you need to get to know the photographers. Yeah. And just started trying to work as hard as I could and film and shoot photos with as many people as I could possibly yeah, do. Totally. And I think from doing that, working hard, showing up, you know, on time, because I found that most people would sleep in, most people would make it to the trailhead. Uh, and maybe if they did, it was just once. So I was like, okay, this isn't that hard of a concept to grasp, but obviously that age and that scene in that culture, you know, people are staying up late and, and kind of getting after it. So to kind of throttle back a little bit and realize you need to, to kind of spread out your priorities a little bit and be professional was an adjustment, but I found that I liked it, you know, and kind of just rolled with it. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, like it's been a, I've seen that, um, call it like a filtering maybe that's taken place that you, there's a lot of people that are able, and especially I could imagine during that time period as well, like, this is coming into like peak action sport years, you know, it's, it was like hitting this like sure. curve. Right. And there's like almost this like accepted, like uh, rock star mentality that a lot of athletes, it seemed like from that era who I kind of got to know some of and naturally they like embody yeah, that rock star mentality that you sort of like lack a degree of professionalism and it, there's like such a yeah filtering that takes place right between like people that all of a sudden are like like oh where where'd steve go like oh, <laughs> yeah. steve got hurt and then he got kind of dropped and then he like couldn't make it back but yeah. like even yeah the simple things right like show up on time have a plan well and like i just realized too that in the backcountry it you know takes a while to move around so to get shots it, it takes a while so on these days that the sun's out and the snow's deep and the stability is good, you only have so much time to get good shots. So I just was, it made sense to me. I'm like, hey, as soon as I'm done shooting this shot, I'm just going to start hiking, even though we haven't figured out what's next. And I just found that photographers always call you back. If you show up on time and you hike your face off uh, and you're, you know, obviously decent enough to hang around, no jokes or something, you know, you can just shoot the shit. Um you become friends with them and it just becomes a, you know, routine and, and kind of another way you get after it. Either you're out shredding all day with the boys on the lifts mm-hmm. um, or you're out shooting all day in the backcountry as a photographer. It was kind of like pretty much half my days were resort days and half my days were out shooting. Um, and I really dug it. And, and I think the professionalism um, goes beyond just, you know, show up and uh, shoot with many people as you can. It's like production. Like, can you produce? Can you be resourceful? Can you understand what producers are dealing with? Um, can you understand like what makes projects happen? What makes trips happen? Who funds them? How do brands get involved? And so I just started really understanding production, distribution, um, and it kind of just all became intuitive. And at the same time, I was uh, in school full time at the University of Utah and to have health insurance, I had to be full time. Uh, and then I had um, a job downtown at the Gateway at a sports bar. So I was working three, four nights a week, just trying to ski every single day, all day, every day. Um, and at the same time, I was starting uh, discreet clothing. So I just had these four crazy, like almost full time scenes that I was just simultaneously plugging away at, but I was just so uh, passionate about all of it that it just became like a pace, you know, it didn't seem overwhelming. Um, It just all worked. And and it's kind of funny because kind of juggling all those hats and that kind of pace of um, just kind of having quite a few projects going on has has never really changed. The projects have changed. Uh, I think the backbone has just been professional skiing has, has stayed. And it's just interesting because that landscape has changed so much from traditional media being uh, kind of the medium. And now there's obviously, you know, a whole different arena that the traditional media is almost the least important. Uh, So it's been really interesting to see 
everything evolved over the past like 10, 15 years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like the landscape has changed so much from a media standpoint in the last decade, but still the, um, the process is like, hasn't really changed, you know, like the backbone of it all. And like, dang, juggling four things at once. Like, were you, is that kind of just always who you were? Or do you think like, cause that takes like quite a bit of like focus and dedication, you know, to not waver off and be like, ah, I'm not going to like fail this test. Cause I hit a sick jump <laughs> yesterday. I'm going to party yeah, tonight yeah, yeah. and like, whatever, I'm going to be a superstar, yeah, yeah. you know, like where did, like, where do you think I, I would say a high level of like focus and dedication. Is that just kind of always who you were? I would say that, you know, my, my mom always was up to tons of stuff. My dad's always just had a lot going on. So I think it just was like in the household. And I think also when things started coming together for me sponsor wise, you know, some of my, some of the most kind of well-known, highly visible guys were like, quote unquote, getting old. And I saw that the ski industry didn't quite embrace their elders like snowboarding and skating. And I saw some of them kind of really confused with their next step in life. Um, I saw some of them bitter and kind of wasting away the bars. I saw some like starting up landscape businesses, which was awesome. I saw other ones going back to school, but we're talking like some of the top, top, top dudes. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, okay, note to self, no matter how good this path works out, even if it works out your wildest dreams have, you know, this isn't your, this shouldn't define who you are. Number one, and you can't put all your eggs in this basket of it being your financial security of your, of your future. And I think that uh, it's been always just natural to me just to have other interests um, other than just like skiing, you know. And, and even though I love skiing and like discreet clothing was more just another way to be creative and be involved in the industry. Yeah. Uh, rather than just like the athletic side. Yeah. Uh, so it's just another way to be in the industry, but also really broaden my knowledge base and like skill set of just how to run a business. Uh, it was kind of a crash course because we launched that during the kind of the 2008 recession. Perfect timing. So yeah, it really gave knows. us uh, good habits to survive <laughs> all that, you know? Um, and that was like a crazy 14, 15 year project that I just sold discreet in 2019. Okay. So, I mean, we were, you know, in the, in the scene for 12, 13 years. So it was, it was a pretty fun project, but yeah, I think just, I've always just had stuff going on. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. You're staying busy. I mean, dude, I think it's like, if you have that, um, wherewithal to sort of see the bigger picture and you see like other people kind of exiting out uh against their will right from yeah. their careers and it's like it's really sobering because in any traditional you know um job setting you kind of see that forced retirement whatever you want to put it take place at the accepted age of in your mid-60s versus in our industry there is this like you are typically retired in your 30s or something and in that in that time and correct me if i'm wrong but like from what i've understood in snowboarding of that era too it was like late 20s year old you know like oh, yeah. there weren't 40 year old pro skiers right or maybe i don't know how old scott schmidt was but like a like unicorn exception and at the time you know that's that's pretty sobering oh yeah no for sure i think it was just like snowboarding if yeah you were getting into your 30s you were donezo yeah like, no you're you're I had, so it was interesting. I had like a similar, um, sobering moment where I was, I, uh, I got introduced to snowboarding very early on and it was kind of in that early 2000s boom that I was like, um, you know, 10, 12, 13, kind of of an age that brands were like investing into, you know, the next generation. And I was sort of a part of this like kid wave that got a bunch of support. And then, the sponsors that I was working with at the time who, you know, were paying, you know, my, my income from those sponsors when I was in middle school and high school was like paying for me to go to school, paying for my housing, all these things, you know? And then, uh, I got dropped by all of them my senior year of high school. And I was like, fuck, like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh no, um, this isn't good. And fortunately I was like, you just get by, you know? And like, I just kind of like still knew I wanted to keep riding, but there was a lot of kids kind of in that 17 to 22 era that like, you know, they don't, 
they don't make it. And having that through my entire career, I feel like it's been, it's been 11 years since that happened. And I feel like just about it within the last year, I've gotten enough confidence back to be like, okay, this is what I can kind of like, I can see my path sure. finally, right? Versus yeah. like, I, you know, I went to the U and I was like in school full time, grinding in the off season, like always kind of knowing that there was just like imminent thing hanging over your head. And I was like, you're not sure if you're going to be cast out or you're like, you might make it, right? <laughs> right. Like, and that's, that's like a lot of weight to balance. I know, man. And congrats on that Brighton contest you just rallied. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That was cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah like all you the know. heavy hitters are out. That was cool. Totally. Was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bomb hole cup. Yeah, it was sick. <laughs> it was well done. That was cool. That you nailed that, dude. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. You know, it's an interesting journey, and like, I mean, that it makes a lot of sense in hindsight starting something like Discreet. And that was that like, had you always kind of been a creative person, or has there always kind of been that like entrepreneurial aspect in your mind, or like, what inspired you to? to go down that route because it's, it is not easy to start yeah. a brand. No, I, I think, uh, ever since I was a little kid, I just always thought in terms of like branding and marketing. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I think just starting a company was just kind of in my blood and then being creative. I think we obviously we're all creative and I think that I just never stopped, uh, doing it in a way and, and lucky enough to find ways I could apply it. You know, um, I think all of us obviously still have, that kind of yearning to be creative, but we don't really have like art class anymore, you know, or any kind of real medium or time that we just get to sit down with a piece of paper and like be creative, you know? Uh, so it was really fun for me to find like a nice way to apply it. Um, and it was cause it took a lot of creative, uh, you know, like requirements. Um, and it was fun to be challenged with that. And I think that luckily I always had fun, uh, you know, whenever it was crunch time and had to come up with good ideas, we always seemed to come up with something. So I think that was part of the fun was having, you know, forced like deadline driven creativity was uh, really challenging and like rewarding because you, you know, just really come up with cool stuff, but your heads stay other with other cool people and think of cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's so rad. Yeah. I know. It's, I mean, it's an impressive undertaking, right. To try like pursue something in that realm yeah but i got my ass kicked like i said of just how to run a business because um, mm -hmm. i what were you going to school for economics okay um, yeah and so so you're kind of you're so, like linear methodical yeah i think i got a good like structure. logical side yeah to me mm -hmm. um and uh yeah i think that that part of it though the nuts and bolts of just running a business really you know there's so much of it that i, I don't really get I don't gravitate towards it. You know, it's not my strong suit, but I know it has to be done. So I think all of that, uh, just running a business, kind of the nuts and bolts of it all is just, you know, super important. And, and, and I had to learn it all and, you know, doing the stuff that I liked was easy and fun, but the rest of it was just like, work. Dang, I gotta figure all this out. <laughs> I gotta work. Yeah, yeah I gotta work. <laughs> dang. <laughs> totally. gotta dang. Work. <laughs> and, you know, this, that's kind of interesting. You're saying you're going to school for like, economics and and that but like i want i want to get in to one of the more well-known things from your ski career and that is your cliff jumping and like can you just give me a rundown of how that started because i'm like i know every like great task kind of has these like incremental small steps eventually you've jumped 100 200 foot cliffs and like I don't see myself going that route and I'm a pro snowboarder what like where did you get the idea were other people doing it what was like because you also like you have your mechanics behind how you'd approach it too like can you just give me a rundown on what how that started yeah so I think it started with even you know as far back as I can remember being a tiny kid in my neighborhood I grew up in the avenues in Salt Lake and so we're on the side of the hill there kind of the bench and I remember running around like first, second grade. I, you know, I put together all the neighborhood kids and we had a roof jumping club <laughs> and we'd go find like okay. sheds to jump off into bushes and stuff. And this is like pre like uh, big brother. Like this is obviously I'm a tiny little kid and yeah. I just wanted to jump off stuff. Yeah. 
So um, I had a trampoline in the backyard. My friends, I'd always make them jump me like super high. And I mean, I'm just this tiny little kid. We'd go to the sledding park and I'd build a big kicker and I'd just come down my little sled and I'd have my friends stand under the jump, hold their sled in the air and I'd go over them. <laughs> and like third, fourth grade. Yeah. So I just always loved catching air. air. It's just the best. Yeah. And I think that anyone that skis, snowboards, the two things you want to do, go fast, catch air. Mm -hmm. That's like kind of what you want to do. It is right? so fun. Right? <laughs> it's like... When it works. When it works, yeah, it's super Yeah, exactly. Fun. <laughs> and so, um, you know, going through my whole childhood, loving team sports. I did a lot of football, basketball, soccer. Uh, did tons of skating. That's all I did for like two or three years. Uh, briefly sponsored by Etnies when I was like 13 or 14. That's what's up. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's weird because if I wouldn't have gotten hurt snowboarding that first day in fifth grade, I know for a fact I would have never skied. I would have never touch skis. I know mm. that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool that I did twist my knee because I don't know if I would have fell in love with snowboarding as much as I did skiing, which okay. is so strange that that kind of path happened. Yeah. And skiing just clicked. And it's so weird now because I feel so at home on a skateboard and on skis. Mm -hmm. And I think living in Utah, uh, obviously I'd seen it on the, the license place, Great Snow on Earth. Obviously, I'd, you know, thrown a million snowballs at cars throughout my childhood. So, uh, but it all didn't quite make sense to me until I started skiing and actually skiing like two, three foot deep. Okay. Below our day. Yeah. And it just clicked. I was like, roof jumping club. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Like I can jump into this. <laughs> <laughs> Airtime. I like that. Yes. Yes. And so <laughs> uh, just what you said, it just, uh, you know, my comfort zone incrementally uh, got bigger and bigger and it, you know, it took a ton of time, obviously, and working through sore necks, sore body, uh, by jumping, you know, at solitude. I remember we had the cliff run and there was like three 10 foot cliffs on this one run. Okay. And big dogs. I mean, we're time. saying I was just cartwheeling into tree wells, like trying three sixties <laughs> off them and just eating spectacular shit, you know? every day all day like permanent sore neck and finally started like understanding how to how to land them and how to like go through the powder and do it in a way that if it's super deep you can put it to your feet and slowly your knees hit your chest and you're, you're skiing away uh, if it's not that deep you go down let your skis hit first scrub it a little bit and then you're skiing away and suddenly i'm like comfortable with five foot cliffs that were once destroying me you know and and not to say that it took two or three years though. And then all of a sudden 10 foot cliffs, the the graduation to 15, suddenly the was like exponent, exponentially shorter to get comfortable to go to 15 feet. Kind and then like, 20 feet, 25. But then, you know, by the time I was in high school, senior, uh, maybe, you know, first year in college, I think I'd hit like a 30, 35 foot cliff. Okay. And it was calm, it snowbird. And I remember right. because it was kind of stepping up. It was a, it was definitely like bigger. Mm -hmm. And two of these dudes that had been skiing their whole lives, I just met them by being at the University of Utah and we all had common friends and they hit it right in front of me. And it was my turn. And it was super deep. And I'm, and I'm my heart rate's going crazy. I'm super scared. And I'm just like, what is going on with me? Like, I know the snow is deep enough. Like, I know that. Like, I know that with all my intellect that that snow is deep enough. And I know I have the skills and the talent to air off this comfortably and land in that snow. Why can't I calm down? And I just laid down up on the takeoff. Uh, I kind of hiked up a little bit, but I remember I just looked up through the trees and they're all kind of moving, saw the clouds and some birds and just try to get a hold of my heart rate and like breathe, you know, and, and calm the fuck down. And I did. I had this like nice sense of clarity uh, and I was able to slow my breath down. And I was able to like see the path of like, I know I can do this and I know this is deep enough. Let that comfort, and let that knowledge be stronger than the fear and it did it traded places and that was really really profound i had never experienced that in anything in my life really um anything that scared me that much i just ran you know so to be able to face the fear like that 
was like pretty monumental and it was you know kind of noteworthy as like a young man I that's like, like that such was a, yeah, yeah that's like such a powerful pivotal experience to and the timing of it with your age too you it know was, it was intense and you know nailed it skied away the bros high five me and they they knew that obviously i was up there scared to death they yeah. knew it was bigger than anything yeah done. they knew i just started skiing like four years before that yeah they were all fired up. So it was just like this really nice feather in the cap in my evolution. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over the next like one or two years, I hit cliffs maybe in that neighborhood. Yeah. But the idea of hitting anything bigger than like 40 feet is just, it was so attractive to me, but so unattainable. It was okay, way yeah. too scary, way too impossible, like totally yeah, crazy. Right? Yeah. yeah. And at the time, Jamie Pierre was in like every movie and every magazine hitting 90, 100, 120, 140 foot cliffs. And up till Jamie, maybe three or four guys in Skeen's history had seen dudes hit uh, a cliff over 100 feet. And those three or four dudes only did it once or twice. Mm -hmm. So suddenly this guy Jamie comes along and he's hitting big cliffs every year. And I'm just like, whoa, how did this dude like crack the code? You know, yeah, like, this is interesting. crazy to me. And I'm like, if this dude can figure it out, I can figure it out. It was kind of my mentality. And he lived in Utah. He was around, uh, you know, knew where some of the cliffs were that he'd hit. So um, I should rewind and say that um, the, so this, this is all happening. I'm really gravitating towards like, how do I become a professional skier? And I, uh, started getting some sponsors, right? So this first year I get sponsors, um, I'd never taken like preseason training more seriously. I was like okay. so in shape. I was so, I'm going to take over Focus. kind of thing. Yeah. But it was kind of like 99% rule where I was like, you know, if the 1% happens, I'll figure it out or I'll have a really crazy crash and I'll laugh it off, right? Because that's how crazy skiing and snowboarding is. Sometimes yeah. you can eat shit and you're fine. You just yeah, laugh. yeah. But so up until then, I'd either just figure out, a, you know, real time, and pull it off, um, or I'd crash and laugh it off. So this year I get sponsors. I am skiing so well. It's this this one year, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, there was no snow and it snowed 100 inches in three days. So um, we go up to Snowbird. It's opening day, 100 inches. So it's like pretty good skiing. And I was skiing just really well that day and kind of just killing it. One of those days where you're like, I'm, I'm just I can't it. go wrong. Right. Just clicking. Just everything's working. Yeah. And obviously I just got my sponsors. I'm just like taking over that year. I'm like, this is my year. And I pull up to this one line that I wanted to ski the year before. I never really uh, had the confidence to do it. And I just saw it that first day I pulled up focused and dropped in it was like a double cliff line with like lots of sharks and like really technical um and anyway i did it and aced it and i was like this is my year you know like this can't be stopped and so ripping around all day my friends are dropping left and right to get water get lunch and i'm just like i'm skiing all day bell to bell bell to bell yeah so then i run into some other buds that are like snowbird lokes and uh they're like what are you skiing jewels i'm like follow me so i'm, I'm taking that line yeah show them what's up you yeah know? and so I, we pull up to the line and of course they're pulling up like really hesitantly like yo this is not a first day of the year kind of a line you know mm -hmm. and and i just pulled up to it and obviously wanted to half impress them yeah and totally. i was like so i just dropped in without totally focusing and I uh, got down in there, hit a little shark on the first cliff, got me over the handlebars over the next one. And all the rocks are kind of passing me by. And I try to stretch out to not hit the, the rock, the cliffs. And I do. Slams me in the, in the hip. Whoa. I'm ragdolling. And I land face down in the snow. And I grab my ass. I'm like, oh, I bruised my ass so bad. You know, it hurts so bad. And I roll over onto my back. And my leg is draped up across my body my boots up on my head like a wet noodle whoa and i'm just like oh my god what did i do <laughs> you know? so i grab my whole leg and like throw it down in the snow it just like plops down whoa and i try to like pull it into its socket yeah. and then i pile all the snow underneath it so at least it's sitting where it should sit. yeah was it like a fracture or did you like your hip come out of your no it was a fracture okay, like yeah, explosion yeah. yeah and so i was like okay move your toes 
and I could. So I was like, okay, that's good news. And because I mean, the leg was completely detached. You totally, yeah, yeah. And and then I'm like, okay, if I start losing consciousness, that means I probably have like a internal Internal. something going on, and this might be it. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, my my uh, alertness never got you know cloudy, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I guess that's not happening either. By then, people are getting to me. And anyway, they're like, so it was so high up that they didn't know if I like shattered my hip and my femur mm-hmm. and all the above. So it was kind of intense. But anyway, long story short, I shattered my femur in 11 pieces and like three of the bone uh, fragments came within like a millimeter of snagging my femoral artery. Jeez. So it's just crazy that I didn't uh, bleed out that day internally. It's, it's a miracle kind of. And so... Um, I took physical therapy like super seriously and obviously getting that hurt really, you know, I had a, had a real sit down and talking to with myself about the path I was on. And yeah. Like, dude, this is a really dangerous path. Yeah. Like, there are consequences. Yeah. And so I was like, Hey, I have to be a hundred percent or just don't do anything. If you're, unless you're a hundred percent, doesn't matter who's around, doesn't matter what's at stake like doesn't matter anything like you love doing this clearly and you're going to work through this injury you're going to get better and that's no question and you're going to get back on your feet and when you start skiing again you're going to make much better decisions <laughs> so that was kind of my promise to myself and i was like either 100 percent or you're out of that situation doesn't matter if like 10 of your friends do it if you don't feel 100 percent, you are not doing it right so um so as i uh you know, start seeing, you know, now this is three years down the road, I'm back on my feet hundred percent and, um, I'm making better decisions. Things are coming together again, right. After basically a year plus off. And so, yeah, Jamie Pierre is hitting everything and I'm just like, all right, this there is, are consequences. It turns out. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> definitely consequences and I'm still, I don't know why I started gravitating towards the idea of hitting big cliffs, but the one in Wolverine Cirque, there's like a really cool one that he pioneered that's like 140, 150 feet, depending on the snow year. Mm-hmm. And I went up there that summer and just like hung out on the edge of it. Hmm. Um, just kind of sat there cross-legged and spent a couple hours. I was just like, I just want to be in this environment. I can see if like the high alpine can kind of like teach me anything just by being up here. And just like, and just feel this kind of energy of like being in such an intense place. Because I'm like being up here when there's snow... Uh, certain is going to be even more intense, you know, and I'm like, just, so I, I just kind of sought out being in those places that summer. And one thing I started doing when I was up there is that when I approached like the takeoff, uh, I was like, man, this would be so crazy. Cause if I was way back here coming towards this, there's no way you can see at all where you're going to land. Yeah. So I was already looking at like horizon markers. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like already instinctively doing that. So I was like, on the edge of the cliff and being like, that's exactly where I want to land. And that's exactly how I want to point it. And if I look up at the horizon, at that rock feature on that horizon or that tree in that rock feature, yeah. when I'm way back on the takeoff, yeah. that's my guideline. And it was kind of interesting. That was kind of fun to play around with that. And the, for like two years, I was just fascinated, but couldn't hit anything bigger than 40 feet. And yeah. Even that still is so intense and it took so much focus um, and, and think through and, and like it was such a crazy thing to do a 40 foot cliff. And, uh, and then finally I kind of had this aha, like aha moment and I was like, okay, when you hit a 40 foot cliff, you're in the air forever, it feels like, right? And even though that might last a second and a half, maybe two seconds. And I was like, if I can just keep my composure for like, 0.5 seconds to a second longer that should equate to with the increased speed i'm having falling yeah okay for every okay. half a second i'm composed it's probably going to stack another 40 feet uh potentially 100 feet if i can be composed for one full second longer so i was like if i can go from two seconds basically of composure which i got down why shouldn't I be able to have 2.5 or three seconds of composure? So that really clicked with me. And I'm hmm. like, that's it. That's the gateway. That's that was like your of, aha. Yeah. And so the next winter comes around. It's like January, super deep snow year. We're having a great year. 
and we're on Cardiff, across the street from Alta, skiing some pow for sunrise. It's super deep, stable. We're skiing down, and we're about to go around this, you know, I could tell it's a big cliff. I was like, oh, hold up, guys. just want to take a peek off this. And they're just like, dude, it's okay. a big cliff. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of get towards the edge, and I look, kind of look off, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's... It's like a 90 foot cliff. <laughs> I was like, I can see the landing down there. I'm like, uh, wow, my heart's going crazy. It's so crazy. Like it's so intense to be in that environment. But I told the dudes, I was like, hey, um, is it cool if we take the time to ski around this? And I just want to probe the landing. And they're like, dude, of course, like, let's go. And I was like, okay. So we go around, we're probing. I'm looking at like kind of the, the, the you know, the sheerness angling, of it. And yeah, the and I'm just like probing. I mean, it's one of those days. It's so deep. It's your whole pole, your whole arm. You could yeah. jump in there and yeah. burrow in for 20 feet. You know, it was, it was so deep. And all the layers bonded super well. It's just like, couldn't have been better. Hmm. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to hike back up there and look at it. And they're like, dude, really? Like, are you sure? I'm like, I think so. And they're like, oh my God. They're like, all right, that's cool. But to hike back up and around took like, you know, 40 minutes because it was just really deep snow and had to put in a whole new track to get around. But I got back up there and I click in and I start to sidestep down there again and just, a, you know, alarm bells, full red, yeah, full sirens. red, just total scared. Yeah. So... Heart rate's going crazy. I'm like looking off of it. I'm so scared. So I, I hike back up to where you can ski down and around. And I almost, I was like, just not this one next time, you know? So I just about dropped in to ski down to be like, let's get out of here. And it just kind of hit me. I was like, dude, you're so interested in this path. What I realized then, I was like, dude, it's never going to not be scary. Like, do you think you're just going to have like, this aha thing and it's there there's it's not going to be scary like if you want to go down this path and if you want to explore this like you need to stay your ass up here it's and like, sit with this fear and and see if you can find that clarity in your abilities and in the snowpack and you know and, and see if, if you can uh find out if this, if you're scared for a good reason that should prohibit you, or if you're scared just because it is scary, but you can still do it because you know the snow is good enough and you know you have the talent and the skill set and, and the composure to do it. So I just came back up again, laid down, hadn't done that since the one at Snowbird, and just started breathing deep. And it was really cool because like the the path, the the one correct path, just kind of that path started to illuminate. In my mind, you know, I was like really aware of all the ways it could go wrong, but I was like, I see the path of how to do this. And that be kind of like became the focus and all that fear was really cool because it kind of, um, it really was like, almost like fueled my critical thinking. And, and from that- it Heightens your senses. And it was, yeah, it really got me to be become present. And I, I became very present and very aware and it all just kind of made sense to me. And it was really powerful again, because all that genuine, really high intensity fear truly got converted into this really calm and powerful confidence. And I achieved a hundred percent. And it was this very calm, calming a hundred percent confidence. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of interesting in that moment, I had a little check-in with myself and I was like, dude, you promised yourself that if you weren't hundred percent, you know, you have to be hundred percent or don't do it. I'm like, you'd be dishonoring yourself if you didn't do this. Wow. Because you're hundred percent. That's a, yeah. a give yourself a check. <laughs> really holding yourself accountable. Yeah. That's, that's, so <laughs> I hit it. Obviously getting in the air. Uh, oh, Did you do the front flip? Well, yeah, let me rewind. When I was yeah. uh, fully, you know, called down on, on the radio, I was like, okay, guys, I'm 30 seconds out. Like I'm doing this. And they're just like, Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. 30 seconds. I put it away and I see this other crew had been shooting off in the distance. And this one guy skis down to me. It's Jamie Pierre. No. Yeah. And I was like, 
and he's like, hey, man, uh, and he kind of sees what I got going on. And he's like, oh, man, this is awesome. And he's like, can I hit this after you? And I was like, of course, man. And he's like, oh, yeah, my name's Jamie. And I was like, it's up, Caught Jamie, on. Julian. Nice, nice, to nice to meet you, meet random you. Jamie. And he's like, oh, get out of your way. And, and he was super cool. He got totally out of my way. And uh, it was kind of rad that he happened to roll up literally at that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was cool. And so I, I hit it straight air. Just a real nice tight package. Not even one window down. Just nailed it. Because I'd never been... You know, it was obviously through all my entire life of doing all kinds of stunts and crazy shit. Like, that moment was the most intense, most consequential most like passion filled years of training years of thinking into this moment you know yeah. and and yeah and my center of gravity couldn't have been more perfect mm. i didn't flow even such a good feeling at all when you're just, like off oh, a jumper cliff was, and you're and like you just you're, you know the oh, instant yeah. you're off too and you're just like, it was it was that yes, times like i did it and, yeah and and then to see the ground that far away you see the point you're gonna hit, but I this bet. was so next level because Dude. the highest I'd seen was like 40 feet. So yeah. suddenly I'm 90 feet up there, and I was like, "Oh my god, the ground is so far away." But anyway, I land, and I, you know, part of the thing with the big cliff uh, technique um, is just to be so relaxed when you come into contact with the snow, so that you don't have an impact. Like literally, just you don't feel it. And this particular cliff, I, maybe to this day, I did not feel anything. Like it was no just way. nothing, absolutely nothing because I was so calm and knew that this was leveling up and I knew I had to be so relaxed on the landing. And like I said, the landing was so deep and I, my both skis stayed on and I kind of went through the cloud of the bomb hole and like got my feet under me and just skied away and then pulled off to the side and I was just laughing because I was like, oh, there is no limit on height. You know, I was like, I can go as big as I want. That is yeah. a crazy so, aha moment. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I could go on and on about the other, you know, profound kind of leveling up to like the biggest one I did was 220 feet. But I did, I've probably done like 30 cliffs uh, since that 90 footer that are over 100 feet. And yeah. all of them, every single one of them took everything I got. Like f uh, every single one of them were super, super scary. Every single one of them, I had to find that clarity. And it's such an intense experience to apply your intellect, your, your spirit and like yeah. in calm presence and find that confidence um, out in the Alpine like that. It's just, it's so powerful. Um, it's almost like meditation, you know, it's Sound, like, yeah, it's it crazy. very meditative. Yeah. We were talking about it, like just so, you know, it's it almost reminds me of like, um, there was like, you know, like free soloing and climbing, right. Where you're just like, technically it's super, obviously it's super dangerous technically. And obviously it's, it's dangerous because the consequences are so high, but like, um, and if, you know, you're at that state of like such a uh, heightened presence and focus that is actually extremely calm and like soothing. And there might be this like before and after kind of build up, but ideally, you know, in the moment you're so like, like, this is where I am. Yeah. You're not, you're not even thinking about anything. You're just like moving, you know, and it, it totally. sounds Cause it's you're, like relaxing. You're tuned in. Like you're, yeah, you're so a part of the energy of your surroundings, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I feel like when I'm in that state of mind that I'm just part of like that charged energy in the, the like the molecules in the snow and yeah. even like the tapestry in the sky and the rocks and my skis and myself, like it's all like this energy bubble yeah. and suddenly I'm in it and yeah. I'm, just, I'm like a fluent part of it because mm -hmm. I am respecting it. I'm not up there to like conquer the mountain or slam a dew and just send it, you know, it's yeah. like, and I think it's a great example he used with Alex because I've used him as like an analogy for some people when they're like, how do you do that? And I'm like, well, you saw how he did that. He just focused. And I'm like, what's crazy to me though, is that when I do these big cliffs, you know, obviously it takes me a while to tune in, but then when I have to execute, it's, you know, maybe, you know, 10 to 15 seconds maximum that I have to be, uh, you know, action. Action focus, and I'm like, yeah. he did it for five hours. Yeah. 
And I'm like, to me, I think, you know, and maybe other people have done similar things in the climbing world. I don't know if that's still like the top one or not, but to me, it's like, still, uh, yeah, like yeah, monumental, you know, him, there's a handful of other characters. Like the coolest thing a human's ever done. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotta be. I know. Yeah. The psychological. Yeah. Cause that's just that it. It's just like you said, the, the, the climbing part of it is obviously can take a lifetime to get in shape to do something like that. But that kind of consequences and the, the mind frame to do that is so extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's so, so admirable. Man, that's, it's wild hearing like your, um, your relationship with the mountains because you, from what I've gathered, you're extremely conscious of um, yourself, your surroundings, your space, your um, interactions and orientations in the, in the space of the mountains. And I, I feel like that kind of, I think it's like a cool segue into, into the Cirque series because like it, it is like a really unique, cool experience. I, so I haven't officially competed in a Cirque series, but I did a, like a course preview with one of the organizers for the snowbird course and kind of just like the, the adventure that you're led on through this, like random hiking, running journey in the mountains is, um, you know, understandably profound. And do you feel like your, do you feel like you're um, like spiritually connected or like a connected person in the mountains? And did that help inspire the idea for the Cirque series or like, what's the connection there? Because you, you do have this like intuitive um, connection. Yeah, I think it goes back to just going on 15 hour hikes with my dad ever since I was born, basically. Mm. Um, he'd get these books that this guy uh, wrote and had his own maps to find like these really abstract um, kind of off the beaten path petroglyphs and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. And we'd go out for these giant hikes finding this, this finding this really crude map, map and you know, we'd each have two Nalgene's and like two oranges. And that was like our day's ration. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and Cars crackers, Cars cracked pepper crackers and mustard sardines. It seems like you guys only, had this down. Oh, yeah. It. But it was the only time I've ever eaten that meal or that snack. But it was the best thing you could possibly imagine when you've been walking for seven, eight hours in the desert. And you crack that open at the, ooh, it was great. But we didn't even make it to... <laughs> the destination often um, because they were just too hard to find. But I, I just really loved being in nature. I love finding a rhythm, you know. I liked finding my breath. I liked finding, um, you know, key kind of things in the terrain that would help me navigate on the way back. You know, just thinking about how to travel through nature was really ingrained in me. And I think that uh, it's one thing I'm grateful for with skiing is that, you know, you're in the backcountry so often and you get to find that breath, you get to find a beautiful relationship with nature. Uh, you're in it all the time. And I think that doing it in the winter as a career, you know, it's, it's uh, always very charged, intense experiences that are obviously beautiful and profound and calm and rewarding but it's usually with a small group of people um and it's very consequential you have to have your safety plan so intact mm -hmm. and it's you know um it's skiing it's it's backcountry it's avalanche education and i think that in the summertime, I love being in the high alpine just as much as in the winter, but the consequences are gone suddenly uh, for the most part. And I think that, you know, I, I mountain biked a lot in the summers. I'd go to South America all the time. Uh, I'd go wake surfing, whatever. And then I got this great dog about 10 years ago <laughs> and she got me off my mountain bike because I took her on some mountain bike rides and I just realized she'd get too beat up if yeah. I took her on a bunch more rides. So I started hiking Mount Olympus. Uh, cause I live right by the trailhead and it was so funny cause people are like, Oh, you've been running, you've been trail running. And I'm like, I don't know if I'd call it that. It's like absolute torture hiking as fast <laughs> as you can up cause it's so steep. And then on the way down took all the agility and strength, uh, and endurance. It was just so captivating. So took everything I had to my capacity. Okay. Um, and I just found it was like such a fun mountain adventure to go, you know, vert, Max Vert kind of oriented peak hikes in the Wasatch, the Pfeiffer Horns, the Superiors, the Grandeurs, the Olympus. And I, I just fell in love with 
kind of trying to back peaks as fast as I could with my dog. And she was, she's kind of, she was kind of an aggressive dog that I had to get her up in the mountains to get her away from mm -hmm. people and, and other dogs, you know, cause she could be pretty aggressive with other dogs. So that was the whole thing. And she got me all of a sudden hiking peaks and I was like, man, this is cool. And I'm loving this. And, uh, so my buddies did forest firefighting and one of the training kind of benchmarks Protocols, to be yeah. in their crew was he had to go from the trailhead of Olympus up to the stream, which is like almost halfway uh, in under, yeah. under 30 minutes. And so I've been kind of hiking it for a couple months and I was like, I got this. I'm always, you know, booting or skinning all, summer, all winter and I'm fast. I'm fine. I'm so I, I just hike as fast as I could. And it was like 31 minutes to the stream. I was so pissed. So <laughs> it's brutal. from that kind of, uh, that was probably like around like a May. It was May when I got my pup in April. So it's May. I try to hike as fast as I can. It's 31 minutes. Anyway, I get addicted to looking at my watch and timing myself. And by the time that fall came around in November, 2251. Nice. So I chipped some serious yeah, time. Yeah, nice. And the, the next spring, so that whole winter goes by, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in. And I would usually do ski conditioning classes in the fall and leave in pretty good shape. But I went into the ski conditioning classes that fall after having a whole season of mountain running, hiking Olympus every day pretty much. I was in way better shape than I'd ever been coming out of it. So I was freak. And that spring, and I'm still hiking the Olympus like that whole winter because, you know, it melts out even if it's good skiing up there. So I'm still hiking Olympus the whole winter. Spring comes, my buddy's wife is like, hey, we're going to do this trail run race down in Moab. Do you want to come? Uh, I'm like, is there any, what's the mileage? Is there any elevation? She's like, oh, it's like 10 miles. I'm like, no, I mean, it's Moab. There's no elevation. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm not really like a runner, you know? I'm like, yeah. I'm probably good. She's like, well, I signed you up. We're, we're going. <laughs> it's going two weeks, so come with us. I'm like, all right, we'll go. So we go down, we're camp. We have, you know, one too many beers the night before. Wake up early, kind of groggy at the start line send it i get second place so i'm just like oh nice is, work thanks i was like yeah pretty fired up because i was like oh man it's i got a positive whole, feedback like, you know maybe off season kind of you know passion thing going thing, on yeah. here so i was like i'm gonna find out what other mountain running races there are like but i should say too there was like three four hundred people in this race it cost like 70 80 bucks there's the business guy coming out. Well, yeah, and I was just, yeah, I just, <laughs> I just observed it and internalized it, but I was like, there was no production value. We we're the, the only, like there's nothing yeah. going on. And, and there were all these young 30, you know, 20, 30 year olds finishing the race. We we're the only car that like backed up, popped the tailgate and like had a beer and a cooler and we're like rooting people through the finish line. Yeah. But there was no production value and everyone would just wait for their friend and leave. And granted it was a beautiful place. It's Moab. It, yeah. was, it was gorgeous. But I was like looking at these dudes throwing the race and I'm like, guys, like you could have done something to make this like, more interesting once you finish some this race. Something. Here, yeah. yeah. And uh, they, we do the awards ceremony. I get 15 bucks to the local coffee shop. Nice work. And I'm just you like, made it big. but again, I was like, how do these guys expect any decent athletes to return if they have no prize money? And I'm like, three, 400 people, you know, 80 bucks. I'm like, good for them. They just pocketed 25, 30 grand, you know? I'm like, damn, like, that's crazy. And then two weeks later at the time I was on the GoPro uh, team and they were like, hey, we're doing the GoPro mountain games. If there's any events that look cool to you, we'll sign you up or just come and hang out. We're all just gonna be there chilling. So I saw they had a 15K mountain run I was like, oh, sign me up for the 15K. So I go thinking I'm in a like podium again. Okay. And, you know, that last race I did, I find out was just a bunch of like, you know, random Joes. So I'm in the start gate and I'm looking around. There's some pretty serious guys. Like, and I learned to find. Why do all these men have veins in their quads? And in like <laughs> short shorts, like way I didn't up know they there. made two inches <laughs> seem short. But it was like the the Joe Grays, the Sage Candidates, like all the U.S.'s best. Premier athletes. Mount, the premier athletes. So, and I didn't know that. I just thought, still though, I was so full of confidence that I was like, for sure, still thought I was going to go like hang with the boys, you know, and maybe win. So we get out of the, the village. They start us like right in Bell Village. 
we turn a corner, we start going up the ski run, and I'm like, I'm a strong climber. Like, this is my strong part. I'm going to pass my everybody because yeah. all these guys took off on me. And they still are just taking Continue. off. And I was like, who are these? So I got really humbled in that race, which was great. But the, the whole experience had this high production value. And it was so cool to be a part of that. But the, the course architecture, the course design uh, lacked. There was no sense of destination. All they did was run us around in like figure eights in the aspen trees until we hit the, the mile marker. And then they brought us back. So you're scaring like, you coming out. Well, something. Right. It's like, you're like there needs to be a destination. Finding. Yeah. You know, and usually if you're, you know, anything, it just made sense to me. I was like, you there should the be peak. a destination. Yeah. And there wasn't. So it just kind of in the back of my head. Oh, so anyway, I get home from that. And that's when I'm like, I'm going to find a, like a hiking Mount Olympus and back down race. And I start Googling and all I can find are the, you know, Hard Rock 100s, Great Western 100s, all the ultras, all the, the speed go, the relay race runs, the mud runs, the Spartans. I can find all that stuff, the mom and pop, 5Ks, the, the marathons. And the only one I could find that was like running up three, 4,000 vert to a peak and then back down. And like, so it's like six, seven miles with a lot of vert with a peak was Mount Marathon up in Seward, Alaska. And they've been doing it for like 90 years. And that is three miles round trip with 3000 vert. It's insane. Those but are I was honest like, numbers. Yeah. And I was like, those people got to figure it out. And I was like, I cannot believe there isn't a race like that in all of lower 48. There's a bunch of them in Europe, but zero in lower 48. There was like the, um, there was a few that like were close, like 16 miles with like 4,000 vert. But I was like, that's just too much. That's not my cup of tea. And I was in the back of my head, I was like, oh, I should start like the Wasatch Classics and have a race on Olympus, have a race on Grandeur, have a race on Beacon Peak. And it was just kind of in the back of my head. And another ski season goes by. We're in Iceland in March, late March. And we have this little uh, farmhouse that they converted into like a kind of glorious camping kind of thing. Okay. And we had a little raft and we just go into these little inlets and find kuars to ski, then come back and stay in this little farmhouse. And after like, you know, 10 days of doing that on the last day, we go up, park the little raft, hike up this kuar. It's like two, 3,000 vert. I get up there first and I'm overlooking the Arctic Ocean. The sun's going down. And I was just like, I'm going to start that race series when I get home. And so that was in 2015, huh. March. And mm -hmm. so Cirque Series had our first races that August and September at Alta, Crested Butte, Snowbird, and Deer Valley um, in 2015. So it was just this really random, got a dog, first of all, that got me off the yeah. mountain bike. And then- It always circles back yeah, to the dog. Yeah, getting into it enough that obviously I did those races. And that was key in me being like, these races were cool, but they were lacking in something. Yeah. Know? And so for me, I was like, mini ultra. You know, yeah. like let's have a race like a that, bites, like, that a like elite people can come out and get challenged. It'll still be hard for them, but, uh, and then people can just be off the couch and all my boys and like dudes like me, bros like us that are kayakers, climbers, it's just a mountain adventure. Cause that's what I found about repetitively hiking Mount Olympus was that it wasn't running. It wasn't square. It wasn't lame. I was like, this is really cool. And I was like, I know more people would be into this. So like, that's, what's so fun about our races is that, um, you know, I do orient them that we go directly to a peak in the most intuitive, direct fashion. Um, once we hit the summit, it's always a real deal summit in the high Alpine. And then we come back down on a different path, you know? Yep. So, and they're all on average seven miles with 3000 bird. Yeah. And, and it's just that random bros show up, tons of guys off the couch. I've seen grandson, dad, and grandpa standing next to an Olympian in the start gate. And so for that range of personalities to, for a race to actually work for everybody, um, it's a pretty unique environment. I mean, dude, it's so unique. And that's like why growing up, um, and you can probably relate to this too. I kind of had this like, I'm a snowboarder, I surf, I bike, I'm like a skateboarder and there's all those like jocks that are just like running and doing football and <laughs> soccer and all this stuff. And it was kind of like an us against them, like child mentality really, but sure. like, uh, and it sounded, 
it's it's just cool to see something like you know the Cirque series where it is this like there is just flavor to it and i feel like from my perspective and this is with zero running experience and i know there is such a supportive like marathon culture and all that but like seeing kind of that like relatable mountain culture flavor in something like the Cirque series is super super cool to see and it also like it like just makes sense you know that you're like oh all the like all these people have been doing this the whole time anyways you know like you just <laughs> kind of had to like meet the pieces together and then have like that tier of like production tenacity to create an experience for people and and that's like exactly what you've done it's cool thanks man i appreciate it and it's been uh you know i think um inclusivity is like something that we really promote um and no elitism right we still we want to like hook up the people that win and make them feel awesome but we want anybody there to feel like super comfortable and welcome um like the first award that we give out when we start the whole award ceremony is middle of the pack award so we literally bring <laughs> up the person that finishes dead middle give them a bunch of loot everyone goes nuts but it sets the tone yeah it's like this is yeah you know, we're, we're we're being inclusive here yeah um, and we have the sport category the expert category and the pro category. Mm -hmm. um, we have the, the Lexi award, which is the name of my dog. It's an unofficial MVP award for just like someone that stood out People's for choice. some random yeah, like, reason. Bring up the Grom, the youngest award, the, the uh, wisest, bring up the, the, you know, the oldest. But mm -hmm. you know, it is with, from a good day skiing and snowboarding and, and adventuring in the mountains. Opre is like crucial. It's like yeah, exactly. it's part of the culture part of the day. Or, or like a, a ski premiere. Yeah, you know absolutely and premiere, so that's you know there's like this moment of gathering and party like well and that's what i also emphasize just as much as like the actual race itself but is like the energy and the finish line like i want it to be a party i want it to be opera i want people to finish the race and make friends and meet their significant other get to know all the brands that are there um and you know it's like core part of a good adventure in the mountains you gotta have a beer after yeah so um and like with the length of the mileage in the race from when the first guys finish that take about an hour which is insane the last place person takes around three and a half four hours so you know there's this like two two and a half hour window that's just like this really fun party kind of atmosphere and and it's one course you know, either a few of our races have a few peaks in it. So it's kind of up and down along mm -hmm. ridges and hidden a few peaks, but we all did the same thing. We all accomplished it. It was all yeah, just experience. as hard for each of us, yeah. even though each person took a little longer. So when you're down in the vendor village after, it's just, just like this really fun shared sense of accomplishment because we all just did that. And I think, you know, a big part of it is having really good music, really good announcer. Um, like, Announcers are key. Yeah, and great yeah. sponsors. Like Backcountry has been a title sponsor for us for going on three years now. That's and awesome. they do a lot for us on the production side, which is huge because when I want people to come to the event and just be like, that was really professional, you know? And, yeah. and having great brands adds to the scenery and adds to kind of the, the culture. And anyway, it could go on and on, but I, I'm psyched you brought up Cirque Series because it's been a way I feel like for me, Spending so much time in the mountains, it's like I'm giving back to the community. Yeah, you know, that's exactly. And, and there's a lot of people that do the races. That it's their first time in the high alpine. Um, they wouldn't have had kind of maybe the the know around of like I wouldn't even know what trail I had to go to. I wouldn't know what to bring with me. I don't know if I would have had the right safety assurances or know how to get to that peak or not. Get back down in a safe way. So I get a lot of people that um, are like, "This is the first time I've been." on a peak in the alpine you know people are flying from florida people are all that kind of stuff and so i think that's part of the fun is uh seeing people graduate even that hadn't done trail run races do a cirque series suddenly i see them doing other races and now they're doing ultras and it's yeah. like what they're doing and they found it by cirque series so it's fun for people to come and do it just have fun or have it be a stepping stone and their kind of love for however they want to travel around in the mountains you know you know hearing to that uh, that experience kind of reminds me a lot of like the, the Dirksen Derby, which is this more grassroots snowboard event. But why that event's so special is because there's this pro snowboarder, Josh Dirksen, he started as a fundraiser. Um, but what you get out of it is this very, like, you get a lot of what snowboarding means to Josh, you know, it's like, 
you're having fun turning at the mountain. And at the end of the day, I think that like symbolizes a lot of what he brought and brings to snowboarding in his career. And, you know, there's a cool parallel with that in the Cirque series that like, I'm just kind of getting to know you through this interview, but it seems like there's a lot of yourself that like plays through into the race series and then the experience. Do you feel like that's kind of the case? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's hard to, you know, put so much time into like the vision of what you want to be without it being, I guess, yeah, a reflection of, you know, maybe what you think is a fun day in the mountains. Right. And uh, to me, I love a nice challenging five hour adventure in the mountains. To me, that is perfect. And one that I can be done with and I'm okay. I don't, it doesn't take me days or weeks to recover from. I admire the guys that are doing hundred milers uh, and all that stuff. Uh, it's just not kind of my flavor. And I think that um, to bring in such an interesting dynamic range, kind of a spectrum of all abilities, uh, to me, that's really important that it sticks to that kind of, you know, I always say no circ series will be over 10 miles because that kind of, you know, tiptoes into you can't just show up and do it. It mm-hmm. does become something you have to train for like big time. Not to say that, you know, people that don't train for the Cirque Series have maybe a more pleasurable next couple days because <laughs> uh, you can be really sore from them. But my point is, you know, it's like to me, just this perfect, fun way to go test yourself. It's really hard and be rewarded, see a beautiful view and, you know, go hike a peak and do it in a way that I'm not building some mud feature. I'm not building some obstacle course that. You know, uh, to me, at the same time, I'm like, man, if someone got hurt on some obstacle that we made, I'd feel horrible, you know, and I have peace because I'm like, we're going into the mountains and that's it, you know, and I think that for me, I I value so much of like my character has been built and being in the mountains by the highs and the challenges. And I think that to share that for people that maybe don't have uh, history or character yet of having part of their personality defined by having adventures in the mountains, I feel like it's something that uh, is significant and it's, a, you know, it's something that substantially impacts, impacts me every year, whether on skis or, or not. And so to, to share that and to create this uh, environment that, um, you know, people can now have it be a part of their, their kind of their experiences in life. It's just something fun that I find a lot of uh, motivation to keep producing really fun events. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so cool. Like at the end of the day, I, I, I'm sure I could come up with a long list of good descriptive words, but it is just, it's really, I think it is something special that you've tapped into and like, it's just that perfect storm and like kind of following who you are naturally as a person, um, to create something like this and create that experience for other people to have. And, um, you know, with that being said, like, what does the future hold? Like, what do you got on the horizon? What are you kind of psyched on pursuing? Um, I imagine that Cirque Series is, and other pursuits will probably be a large part of your vision. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, we expanded uh, a seventh race to Ingleberg, Switzerland last saw year. That. So yeah, Congrats. we're it's awesome. international now, which is, you know, again, I've been skiing in Ingleberg, Switzerland for 14 years. That's where I have the 220 foot uh, cliff is there. So I made a lot of friends in that community and um, throughout the years of Cirque Series, there always was like, we should have a race here. And our co-title sponsors on running and they're based in Switzerland. And so they were really excited about the idea and over like pretty much four years of figuring out all the ins and outs to produce a race over there. Uh, a lot of moving parts, but we we're pulled off last year. So, you know, I think that's, I'm pretty content with our seven races that we do have. That's a um, lot. Yeah. By numbers, we're the, we're tied for the most participants for a trail run race series uh, or for a race series. We are like the one, right? But the, the biggest trail run event is run the rut, which is a really cool race up in Montana. And they have 3,500 runners that come out and do it over the whole weekend. And I was like thinking about it. I'm like, that's the biggest one in the U S huh? I was like, all, all seven of our races combined are 3,500 people. So I'm like, well, I guess we're tied then. Um, so that was kind of <laughs> cool to hear that, you know, we have that feather in the cap of being like, by participant numbers at least, the 
tied for being the biggest trail run company, you know, in the U S. So it made me proud because I do, I work my butt off, like basically starting now through our last race in September, I'm pretty much head down, uh, you know, I'm the active race director and the logistics get pretty intense, but my, uh, I'm always asked to add more races on, uh, we've had, you know, quite, quite a few opportunities, really exciting, fun places. And of course I want to say yes to all of them. Yeah. But I'm really content with the seven that we have. So I think the future of Cirque Series is the seven. I like these seven. I think if we mix it up at all, it'd be pretty, uh, you know, I guess interview me in a year or after that happens. But right now I think the seven that we have are are great. And I think I find that my pace of life is awesome because in the winters I can focus on professional skiing and steer some ships you know there's plenty of conversations going on in the background for Cirque series but once may comes around i really shift gears um and it's just a nice kind of a timing thing um, yeah that i can put my energy time and resources into uh, skiing professionally and then you know really take pride in taking the time to do dot all the i's cross the t's to be the the race director but um on the side i got two little side businesses going on okay, now. Are, yeah. I call them hobby businesses. Yes. And one's a, a Ford Bronco restoration business. Okay. And yeah. I've been, I've restored 12 over the last, uh, well, I'm, I'm on my 12th right now over the past uh, two and a half years. And then uh, through restoring these Broncos, you have to, you know, obviously source all the parts. And that's kind of one of the hardest things. And one of the things that just ties these builds together, if you can find them, There's these really cool 70s retro floor mats that are really hard to find. And it's probably the most random thing you've ever heard. But I found that whenever they pop up on eBay or some random Bronco, like Ford Bronco forum on Facebook, as soon as they pop up three, 400 bucks, like multiple people wanting to buy them. And so I was like, man, I should just send one of these mats to one of my factories that I've been working with for years and reproduce these. So anyway, last August, no I launched dojamat.com <laughs> and we are in like lmctruck.com is one of our main distributors and they're kind of like an Amazon of the truck scene, classic truck industry. Um, and things are going really well, but that's just been a really fun hobby business that was kind of connected to uh, restoring the Broncos. So yeah, I got a retro floor mat company that's full on blowing up right now. You are a smart, <laughs> smart guy. I should, I need to like, I'm, I am taking notes, but dude, that is impressive. I mean, and that's the biggest thing, like from my understanding of, of business and entrepreneurship is you sort of like see a market need, right? And like, I think that Discrete seemed like it was kind of this, a crash course and like a, a place to get your foot in the door, right? Like headwear apparel things like that and then the Cirque series is like niche market need and like you know the bronco uh restoration is kind of that like niche interest but then you found like a specific need within that and that's just totally. like that's really cool man Thanks. that's impressive I I, you know i yeah. think I, I love the quote the best ideas are usually the most obvious interesting yeah. <laughs> dang <laughs> <laughs> and you know on that um, I think we're going to start wrapping this thing up. I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to catch, catch up with you, man. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I'm, I would say I was partially familiar with your story and now I am more familiar with your story and it is a really good one. So I enjoyed hearing it and yeah. I just wanted to thank you for like coming on, catching up and chatting with us of course man it's reciprocal and it's great to get to know you better and you better come out for a race this summer i know i'm gonna try i'm gonna try, <laughs> <All> <laughs> try right. to make yeah. it happen yeah oh well you're the man and to everyone that tuned in i hope you liked the show make sure to like comment and subscribe and in the meantime from the crew at backcountry we will see you out there